Good morning. It is a joy to be back in worship with each and every one of you. I am Reverend Corey Alexander Lillette, and it is my joy to be the pastor here at St. Bethlehem. Joining me in worship leadership this morning is Margaret Fisher on the piano. I want, before we get deep into worship, I just want to express my deep thanks for each of you. For all of your support while I have been out, for the welcome you gave to my dad last week, to the people who helped make worship happen in the midst of what felt like a million changes in plans. As I have been here for what we realized is coming in on four months, I have continued to be blown away by this conversation. 
by your willingness to step up and make things happen and support one another and love one another. And so when I say it is my joy to be the pastor here, I absolutely mean it. So, whether this is your first time here, or you have been attending for years, whether you are strong in your faith or you still have some questions, whether you're worshiping with us in person or joining us online, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. And it is a joy to worship with you this morning. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Welcome to worship today. Bring your joys and sorrows to the Lord. Give your fears to the Lord, for God will heal your souls. Open your ears and your hearts to the Lord. Amen. I invite you now to join me in our mission statement. Growing disciples of Christ for the transformation of our community. We have a few announcements this morning that I want to draw your attention to on the back of the bulletin. You will see that the office will be closed tomorrow in observance of Columbus Day. Also, the UMW Day Group will not be meeting this week. They will have another meeting on Tuesday, November 9th at 10.30. Also, our Bible study resumes this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. We are starting stewardship today. And so we will be doing stewardship for five weeks. I will not be talking to you about money for five weeks because I don't think anyone wants to listen to me do that. But we will be talking about the ways in which our United Methodist membership vows of prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness are all a part of our stewardship. And so in We'll be, I'll be doing a sermon series over the next five weeks, and also we'll be diving deeper into it on Wednesday nights in our Bible study. And so I hope that you will all join us. Our charge conference will be next Saturday, um, September or October 23rd at 11 a.m. at New Providence United Methodist Church. There is a chance it will be moved to virtual, and I hopefully will have that information this week. Also, we'll be having Trump or Treat on October 31st from 2 to 4 p.m., which gives the kids plenty of time to go Trump or Treat and then also go Trick or Treat in their own neighborhoods. In conjunction with Trump or Treat, we will have a blessing of the animals. I don't know if it has circulated on your Facebook page like it has on mine, where a bunch of pets got blessed last weekend in honor of St. Francis. And so we will be having our own pet blessing at our trunk or treat, and we are encouraging people to bring their pets in costume. And part of this is selfish because I just wanna see a bunch of pets in costumes. But if you don't have a pet that will travel well, you can bring a picture and we will bless the picture as well. We do need volunteers to make trunk or treat happen. There's a sign up sheet in the narthex to either provide a decorated trunk or to provide treats for our trunk or treat event. If you have any questions, you can see myself or Margaret. Finally, you may notice that the last two weeks we have had a bulletin insert. This insert, you might, you'll see the prayers of the people on the first page. If you flip it inside out, you will see a description of what is included in this insert. Instead of doing a pastoral prayer today, Margaret is going to play some music, and we are going to engage in, this, in these different practices of prayer. There's a prayer labyrinth that you can trace with your finger or trace with one of the pins in your pews. There's also a section for prayers of the people where you are invited to write in prayers for yourself, your community, 
your family, and your world. And then on the back, we have this week's prayer calendar from the UMW. And so during our time of prayer, you are invited to engage in this how you feel led. And then I will close us in a short prayer, and we will close together in the Lord's Prayer. I will give another reminder when we come to that part of the service. Are there any other announcements this morning? Seeing none, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together our opening hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer, hymn number 496. to remain standing as we affirm our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>
You may be seated. Let us pray. When nothing is right, when we are weary and lost, when dull, when clouds dull the sky, help us to be still. When our cries are unheeded, when no effort bears fruit, when the sun sets, help us to be still. When love is over, when hope is gone, when darkness covers the land, help us to be still. For in being still, in refusing to panic or despair, we shall come to know that God is there, suffering alongside and with us, waiting to show us stepping stones through the swirling waters and to help us sing a new song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Lord, Listen to Your Children Praying. In the faith we sing, number 2193, we will sing it through twice. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Beloved, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The words of God for the people of God. As I mentioned earlier, over the next five weeks, we will be exploring the relationship between stewardship and our United Methodist membership vows. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. When we think about stewardship, we typically think about just the financial piece. And while yes, the financial piece 
is an important piece. Stewardship is much more than that. Stewardship is an act of being faithful with all of God's resources. As a people called Methodist, John Wesley laid out rules for holy living, which are do no harm, do good, and attend upon the ordinances of God. The third rule has been changed to stay in love with God, but regardless of the wording, it includes the reading of scripture and participating in the sacraments and deep prayer. This morning we heard the closing section of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. After establishing the church at Thessalonica, they began struggling in his absence and doubting the things he has said, especially since Jesus has not returned yet. Paul writes to them to reassure and encourage them to keep their faith in Jesus. Verses 16 through 22 that we heard today are often referred to Paul's shotgun paranesis because he quickly fires off these imperatives as the letter is concluding. He says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. And Paul isn't just encouraging the church to do these things. But he himself is modeling them. Early in the letter, Paul urges joy in the midst of persecution. In the midst of the persecution that the young congregation is facing. And Paul, et al., has modeled that joy for them. And this joy is manifested not in present circumstances, but on the present and future manifestations of the new age that comes through Christ Jesus. Paul's command to rejoice always is to exalt in this new age, this new life that Christ offers us. In the same way, throughout the letter, Paul is praying for the congregation at Thessalonica. He opens the letter by telling the church that he is, quote, making your prayers constantly. Prayers of thanksgiving and wish prayers are also abundant throughout the letter. While the church is facing persecution, they do so with the reminder that they are not facing it helpless. They are equipped with joy and prayer and therefore are able to rejoice and give thanks. The next three imperatives have a different feel than those first three. Paul tells the church, do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. There are scholars who believe the link between these is this emphasis on the Holy Spirit. And others emphasize that they are a continuation of the previous one, providing more resources for the church to continue living into new life in Christ. There is no escaping the power and movement of the Holy Spirit in any of these imperatives set forth by Paul. Throughout the letter, Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit as an agent of inspiration and as God's gift to the believers who are reliant on the Spirit to live into the holiness to which they are called. As we hear verses 21, 20 and 21, we hear the invitation to hear the words of the prophets and to pray and discern over those words. This doesn't mean that we disregard anything that might be difficult to hear, but it encourages the church to be intentional, intentional about processing what they are hearing. And this exhortation shows the congregation that they have within them 
all they need for every decision and every deliberation that faces them. Together, this section provides resources that are given to the church to help strengthen its mission and give them the strength to continue walking along this path that has been set before them. As I hear these words from Paul, I'm reminded of the importance of maintaining our spiritual health. As United Methodists, we commit our prayers to one another and to the church. We know the power of prayer and have experienced the Holy Spirit through it. When I was in seminary, I worked at Grace United Methodist Church in Midtown Atlanta. During my time there, we partnered with a nonprofit called the Matthew Initiative. The Matthew Initiative partners with churches to walk them through a process of launching a children's ministry program. It's a year-long process that includes listening to community members, volunteer training, and an abundance of prayer. One Saturday in September, we had a day of prayer for our new children's ministry. We had prayer stations that included a map of our community, music note paper where we were invited to write a word because our theme was singing a new song. There were finger prayer labyrinths and several other different stations. We were invited to move through the stations and actively pray for our community. We were invited to do so in silence. There was a group of about 15 of us, and 14 of us were adults. And one of us was a fourth grader who was the son of one of the security guards at Grace. And as we were going through these prayer stations, he was going through them with us, and he and I were going through them together, and I was helping explain things, and we were having these moments of prayer together. At one point, we separated. And from the back of the church, we all heard him singing the words we had written. He was singing the new song that we were praying for, that we were hoping for, that we were planning for. And in between the prayer stations, we would gather in a conference room for a time of discussion. And in that, we were invited to dream about our community and come up with ways to make that dream a reality. We didn't have to think about money or time or building permits or anything. We were just dreaming and praying for the way that our church could be an inclusive and welcoming place. When we launched the Big Children's Program a little over a month later, we had 16 children from the neighborhood come to be in community with us. We shared meals and played games and grew in our faith together. Grace surrounded those kids and poured out God's love upon them. And I will admit that the first time I did this stewardship series, I didn't actually preach a sermon the week of prayer. Instead, we set up prayer stations throughout the sanctuary and invited the congregation to spend time in prayer together. There was definitely some hesitancy and skepticism as people came into the sanctuary that morning and things were not set up the way they were used to. In fact, the first person I saw that morning said, my late husband would have hated this. He hated change. Needless to say, it was not exactly the most encouraging start to my morning. However, as we moved through the prayer stations together, the presence of the Holy Spirit was palpable. It was a beautiful time of remembering that we are a community in prayer together. 
A few weeks later, one of the members who was present that Sunday came up to me and said, you know, I wasn't sure about the prayer stations. It was kind of weird. But this week, God answered the prayer that I prayed for that day. Karl Rayner was a German Jesuit priest and theologian. He said, everyday life must become itself our prayer. As we care for our spiritual health, our prayer life and our everyday life begin to merge. And we know that in order to care for the spiritual health of our community, we must also care for our personal spiritual health. I hated that I missed World Communion Sunday last week. It is one of my favorite days in our liturgical calendar. As we participate in the Holy Communion liturgy, our voices, our prayer, joins in with the heavenly host. We hear the words, and so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. And on World Communion Sunday, we know that those words are spoken in multiple languages, prayed in churches that meet in houses and in huge, ornate sanctuaries uniting all of us across time and space. Our prayer is powerful because our God is powerful. And as we pray, as we are in communion with God, God reveals God's self to us. Prayer invites us to know God more deeply and for God to know us more deeply. And when we are known, when we are loved, when we are prayed for, we are then able to know one another more deeply. And being known by God and by one another invites us to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. Because we are never alone on this journey. We feel the presence of prayer among us. Over the last week and a half, Ryan and I felt the presence of your prayers with us. In times where we have lost loved ones, we feel prayers with us. In times of uncertainty, particularly about the future, we feel the prayers with us and pray even more fervently in those uncertain times. We pray for this church on the corner of Old Russellville and Rossview. We pray for its growth. We pray for its community. We pray for its members. And at the root of our prayer is always deep love. And so I ask you this morning, as members of this congregation at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministry by your prayers? If so, please say, I will. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. I invite our ushers to come forward. Oh God, you. 
you have given us an abundance of gifts, and we lift our prayers up to you. We pray that our offering is used to further your kingdom on earth. May you pour out your abundance and grace upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another reminder that during this time, during these few minutes, you are invited to pray using the insert. The altar is also open, and if you would like me to pray with you, I am absolutely available to do so. After a few minutes, we will close with a time of prayer and with the Lord's Prayer. And so, let us go to God in prayer.
Oh God, you have heard our prayers. We lift each and every one of them up to you. And now with the confidence of children of God, we pray together the prayer that Jesus first taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 64. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, you are invited to stand as you are able.
the part knowing that we are praying for one another always. And that God hears each and every one of our prayers. And so, go in peace. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen.